Like many people my age, I grew up watching a TV show called Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And the theme song of that show started with the words, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. However, in 1968, when that first show aired, there were many neighborhoods not singing that song. Because the Jim Crow era laws that mandated racial segregation made it such that the neighborhood in which you lived determined the life that you had. The golden rule tells us to treat your neighbor as yourself, but it doesn't tell us who you should consider your neighbor or that you should ignore the people that aren't. In psychology, there's a phenomenon that people call the familiarity principle. Put simply, that means that people tend to be more comfortable with things that they're familiar with. Therefore, Jim Crow era laws that mandated racial segregation exacerbated an already problematic societal structure that made it such that people did not get to know each other because they weren't around each other. But that was 50 years ago. So therefore, we should think that the neighborhood in which you live now should have no bearing on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. But unfortunately, the neighborhood in which you live has more of an impact on your survival than you may even know. I first want to start with getting you more familiar with my story. My family moved to the States from Nigeria when I was young. Both of my parents were physicians, but they had to redo their residency in the States when they got here. So they did so at Johns Hopkins, Georgetown, and Howard University. We then moved to Indiana where I went to elementary school and junior high before I attended high school at a boarding school in Western Massachusetts called Deerfield Academy. I then went to Stanford University where I was on the captain of the track team, president of my class, and graduated with honors before matriculating to the University of Michigan Medical School and matching into the Department of Orthopedics at Yale. I went on to get a master's degree from Notre Dame, was appointed to the St. Joseph County, Indiana Board of Health by Pete Buttigieg, and then did a family medicine residency in South Bend before going back to Michigan to be on faculty in the departments of family medicine and physical medicine and rehabilitation. As a physician, I can appreciate the level of privilege that I have. However, I do know that that level of privilege changes because even though I have all of these degrees and the pedigree, if you know nothing about those, I know that people still just see me as a young black man. Whether I'm driving in my car, trying to pay with cash at a convenience store, or going for a run. No matter how long my white coat or how visible my stethoscope, I know that there are still some people that are not going to see beyond the color of my skin. It has become brutally obvious to me that the perceptions other people have of me are based more on their perceptions of what neighborhood I belong in and less to do with the intersectional framework with which I see my own life. Now, you may think that that level of privilege and the life that I lead doesn't impact things at all. But once again, I tell you that today we now see that the COVID-19 pandemic has had a disproportionate impact on communities of color all over. Now the World Health Organization describes the social determinants of health as the conditions in which people are born, live, work, and grow. Those are the conditions that are responsible for these health inequities. These health inequities, which are the unequal, uneven, and unfair factors that lead to the determination of your health. National data have shown that the COVID-19 death rate is six times higher in communities that are non-white when compared to communities that are white. A colleague of mine, Dr. Malika Fair, recently talked about the fact that these social determinants of health are the reasons and the differences between the health that we see in our populations. Now, I just recently had a conversation with a group of my students about the Tuskegee experiments of untreated syphilis in the African-American male, which happened all too recently in our history. Those are the reasons why people still have a mistrust for the healthcare system, because in those experiments, the National Health Service intentionally withheld treatment and diagnosis of syphilis for the black men that were enrolled in that study. Now, if we want to consider death the ultimate example of a lack of health, then the recent deaths of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, and Breonna Taylor should be a striking example of the fact that black people are not valued equally as others in our country today. 
Now, after those conversations about Tuskegee, a lot of my students left discouraged, wondering how they were ever going to be able to dismantle the structures that had been built upon long before they came here. But in order to change the culture of all of these institutions, we must first start by changing individuals. And that is precisely what a group of University of Michigan medical students are doing with STEER HD. STEER HD stands for Students Teaching, Educating, and Evaluating to Reduce Health Disparities. We have partnered with Walgreens and Omron Health to deliver blood pressure cuffs free of charge to communities in our area, as well as teaching them about educational practices to manage their blood pressure. Each individual has an ability to make a difference and to change the cultures and the structures that we are in. Now, the disabled community is another one that has been disproportionately marginalized for quite some time. The WHO describes certain populations of disability as having an increased risk of being affected or being unintendedly and not known to be affected by this pandemic. Individuals with physical mobility problems that are not able to socially distance well because they rely on other people's care. People with intellectual or developmental disabilities that may not understand things like washing your hands. And then people that, 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 that may rely on other people, people that cannot communicate and address people and tell them that they have these things because they cannot see people's faces because they're deaf and everyone is wearing a mask. Now, people with disabilities, and with chronic health conditions have already been long marginalized. They already felt as though their lives weren't valued before this, and now they fear going to the hospital because they think that when they get there, care is going to be rationed in favor of saving a life worth living. Now, this has a silver lining, however, because due to the familiarity with inaccessibility of our world, the disabled community is keenly aware of how to create solutions to problems by our ability to then adapt to any environment. I often tell a story that, that a man told me about his son. He said his son was in kindergarten, was colorblind, and his homework would say, color the circle blue. He used to ask his son, son, how do you get your homework done? It says color the circle blue, but you're colorblind. And his son looked back at him with this perplexed look and said, Dad, I never use crayons that aren't labeled. Now, this is just one indication of the fact that the solutions to problems that we see are sometimes much easier than we would know, especially when we involve the people who were impacted by those problems in the first place. Now, we then ask the question, who is actually impacted by the problems that we see today? That goes back to the question of who you think your neighbor is. Now, if you think that perhaps your neighbor, you may know someone. You may know someone, and if your neighbor's house is burning down, you feel like that impacts you because you know them. You feel like that impacts you maybe because you may even love your neighbor. Or that may only impact you because you then fear that your house will be burning down next. I didn't fully understand the plight of the disabled population until seven years ago when I myself dove into a pool and broke my neck, paralyzing me from my chest down, thrusting me into this world of disability, and then instilling in me the conviction to then approach the intersections of disability and race to realize the implications that those intersections have on life. This neighborhood that I now live in, this neighborhood that I now understand the things that others are going to, even though had you asked me before, I would have thought that I was treating them as my neighbors. I would have thought that I understood the things that they were going through, but I did not. And not because I had some intentional desire to exclude them, but because I just did not know the needs that they had. I sit in front of you here today in a standing frame wheelchair that has allowed me to do medical procedures and surgeries that has returned me to getting access to the world of medicine that I love. It is with this simple solution that I've been able to then return to this world and be able to participate in a way that I once used to. Now, people often wonder how one individual or one group can create any difference in this extremely difficult situation that we see ourselves in. But both of these pandemics, COVID-19 and racism, have demonstrated to me that institutions that have created these rules are only built upon the individuals that have the power to move the needle. 
right now a group of medical students all across the country are demanding change. They are reaching out to their institutions and saying that the time for change is now. They're saying that we must dismantle the structures of institutional racism and segregation that the foundation of medicine and healthcare has been built upon in order to eliminate race-based medical practices, in order to create anti-racist curriculum for their patients, for the students, for the faculty and the staff, and in order to demonstrate that we need to create a culture that is intolerant of any type of prejudice. I must admit that prior to me having that accident seven years ago, I had not had this radical change that is needed right now. I did not fully acknowledge and know that there were people that were not being treated the same as others, even though I thought I entered a profession where that was the reason why I was there. Now, not all of you are going to be able to be disabled black men, but it shouldn't take you having the lived experience to be able to acknowledge that racism and ableism are the reasons why people that you may not consider your neighbors are having a devastating time right now. So while you may not have seen them as your neighbors yesterday, my hope is that after this, you will see them as your neighbors tomorrow. Because even though you may not understand what people are going through, I sure hope it doesn't take you breaking your neck to realize that this problem affects you as well. We are all only as healthy as our most vulnerable neighbors. And if we cannot find a way to care for those neighbors, then you too someday will be sitting in a neighborhood on top of rubble in what used to be a beautiful day in your neighborhood. The future will be your fault, even if the past is not. We are all in this together. And therefore, I wanna end with just an invitation the same way that Mr. Rogers always began his. We are all in this together. And so let's make the most of this beautiful day. Since we're together, we might as well say, would you be mine? Could you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Thank you.